Listen up, real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and agents. You're in the right place. Unlocking the secrets to real estate investing and entrepreneurship. Welcome to the Titanium Vault, hosted by RJ Bates III. Here's RJ. Hello, and welcome to the Titanium Vault. I'm your host, RJ Bates. Today, I'm with Jawad Dashti. Jawad, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. So why don't you take a second to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do in real estate investing. Um, well, I, I do a lot. For the people that know me, I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, I guess I'm a little too greedy. But, uh, you know, uh, my main focus, you know, everybody that sees me says, hey, there's the wholesaler. Um, I really don't feel like I'm a wholesaler, even though I do it a lot. Uh, my main objective is always, you know, the buy and hold, uh, because in the end, I don't want to have to work forever and I want to let my money, you know, do the work for me. Uh, but I also do, uh, very often wholesale just to keep my money up because no matter how much money you've got, you can easily go broke real quick. Uh, when you're spending a hundred, 200 K at a time, <laughs> sometimes more, um, you know, and sometimes I do different strategies, uh, whether it's sub to or picking something up that was seller financed or, you know, whatever to build my portfolio. Cause in the end, that's my main goal. Gotcha. So let's go back to the beginning when you got started in investing, how did you get your start? Um, I've always been, interested in real estate and uh you know just like a lot of people didn't really have the guts to make that first move um never went to any like classes or anything although i probably should have and uh you know i owned a plumbing company that started i started in 2010 and you know i made a lot of money with the plumbing company over time and uh you know had a little more than a half million dollars in my savings that I knew I needed to do something with. And one day I sat with my personal banker and he explained to me um, basically how inflation works and how I'm losing money, having my money sitting, you know, making half a percent in savings and that I needed to do something to make a minimum of 3% a year on my money or I was losing money. And so that always stuck into my head. And uh, I'll really never forget that and appreciate that moment and bit of gold that he shared with me because it really kind of changed my perceptive on the way that I thought about stuff because I was always trained to, you know, save money and put it away and don't spend it. And, you know, I guess the, the old way that college is everything and saving accounts is the world. Um, so with my plumbing company, I started learning that, you know, customers weren't always the greatest thing because I was getting checks that were bouncing or credit card chargebacks and just everything in the world. And then I started picking up these new property management accounts, which I didn't even know what that was at the time. And these people were awesome because they would just shoot me an email. I need this fixed and we're going to pay you this. And the money came every time. And the more I got into that, the more I started learning about real estate and seeing it from different angles and definitely realized that's something that I wanted to be a part of. So I took the initiative to learn more and educate myself, which now for the people that know me has become a passion of mine, even though, you know, people think that I know a lot about real estate, you never know everything. So I'm always trying to educate myself. But, uh, you know, once I decided that I really wanted to make that first step, I uh, started watching MLS and, you know, all the off-market stuff. And this really before Facebook was a huge thing. And uh just remember finding my first deal. And uh I bought this house and uh got it for, at the time, probably 30%. And it was a probate deal, even though I didn't even know what that was at the time. But, you know, I tell people all the time with Google and YouTube, you never have an excuse um, to never be able to do something. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm, I was huge on it. You know, I didn't even know the right people to ask, which is always best. You don't have to know everything, but you got to know the right people. 
and I didn't know the people, but I knew Google and YouTube, and I found out how to make the deal happen, and I bought a three-bedroom, one-bathroom house in Mesquite for 39000 and, uh, you know, at the time, I didn't even know what a title company was. They just signed a deal over to me. Luckily, it came back later that it had a clean title, but, you know. <laughs> I learned over time, you know, and I killed it on that house because uh, I, I definitely knew what Section 8 was because the property management companies we were doing work for were 100% all about Section 8. And I bought that house and put a tenant in it, was making 1280 a month in rent immediately. Wow. And I was like, wow, this is an amazing return. I want to do it again. So after that, I was just hooked. Gotcha. So yourself taught yourself how did you get into wholesaling um so i i knew that i i guess i should have learned earlier what wholesalers were because i used to buy from them not even knowing it i remember there's a condo i still own today um and i bought it from a wholesaler and he told me what that was but i thought that was just a phrase i didn't really understand it was like a title and a thing enough to look into it and he sold me this condo. He wanted $25,000 for it. And I ended up talking him down to like $12,000. And it was in this terrible community. Um, but I bought it for twelve grand. I put 2000 into it, just paint, carpet, and started renting it out for nine fifty a month. HOA was like 114 a month. And really, you know, killed it on that. And that was like, I don't know, one of my first 10 deals, fifth or sixth, something like that. Um, but that's how my first, I guess, uh, interaction with the wholesaler was, and for some reason, it didn't click in my head to learn more about it then at that moment, but there's a, a deal a lot of people know about that I did called the, the Disney House, and, uh, you know, I made $75,000 on wholesaling the property without even knowing I was doing that, <laughs> uh, but I had, I had got this house, and I got it for $9,000 because they had a lien nobody knew how to get rid of. And with Google and YouTube, I was able to get rid of this lien. And uh, I just posted up on Craigslist because I and was like, hey, how do I make this deal happen? Who can I sell it to? And this wholesaler approached me. Still to this day, I have no idea who he is. He's probably one of my own friends now. Um, but he approached me and he was like, I can give you. 85k for this house today and i was like man done deal um so we like co wholesaled on it i guess and i still didn't even know what a wholesale was when i was done because you know they don't want to teach you what they're doing right i made 75k off that deal and then i started just learning more about it from people that are doing what i'm doing now people just talking about it and teaching and i i do understand there's a lot of people out there that don't that don't learn from it, but, you know, people can't teach you everything, and they sure definitely 100% can't do it all for you. But I started at least understanding the gist of it, did a lot of research. I go to meetups every day, like every single day. Sometimes I go to two a day. Always try to expand my education, um, you know, just, just meeting with attorneys, meeting with people who have done it, and always just trying to learn, you know, new ways into it, so... I guess that's how I really got into it. My first one to do by myself, I had a friend reach out to me, and uh, a wholesaler was trying to buy his house, and he said, hey, I know you got a couple of rental units. Can you look at this contract? And I was like, man, this guy's, you know, really not offering nothing at all for your house. I think he was offering like 40%. His house didn't need any work at all, very desirable neighborhood. And I was like, what do you want for it? And, you know, he told me a price, which turned out to be about maybe 60% for it. And I was like, yeah, I can help you out with that. And I made one phone call to a friend of mine that buys rentals in that area, you know, made $20,000 in two phone calls and was kind of hooked from there. Right. So when you were, when you were doing all of this, were you still running your, your plumbing business or did you kind of put that on auto drive and put someone else in charge of that business? Um, I was 100% doing the plumbing company when I first started. Um, you know, I had employees, but, you know, I started off just by myself and expanded that to what now is like somewhere between 20 and 30 employees. And uh, that's 
shows you how much little input I have into it these days. Is I don't even know how many people work there now, but it, it's self-driven now. It got to a point to where, you know, when I started the plumbing company and I was making seven figures, I thought that was like my end game plumbing company. Let's open up a chain of them and I'm going to do this everywhere and it's amazing. But I realized that there's too many variables, uh, which are people. And, you know, people you, you can't control them, nor do you want to. You don't know what they're going to do. Um, you don't know if somebody's going to pay you. You don't know if somebody's going to quit their job. You don't know what. In real estate, you have a lot of control. Um, you know, if somebody doesn't want to buy the house from you or you don't want to sell it to them, you can easily sell it to somebody else. You know, if your bills are right and if you have a tenant and you don't like them, I mean, snap of a finger and they're evicted out in the state of Texas. So uh, it, it just seems like something that could be easier scaled and uh, a little bit more control. So it got to the point where I started changing the plumbing company to something that could be systematized. And I let somebody take the reins of it and then started walking away from it and really just pushed myself into real estate to do full time just because I could easily, you know, do seven figures, if not more in real estate. And, you know, why not have both? And how long have you been full time in real estate? Um, full time, I'd say four years overall, seven years. Gotcha. And all of your deals, it sounds like you're financing yourself. You're not using any private money or hard money loans or anything like that, right? Yeah, correct. So um, I guess that was one of the great things about, you know, having all that money was that I was able to spend it and get the deals that I wanted. Um, something that I've been – and I've always been that person who, uh, you know, was all about raised – where if you can't afford it with your own money, then you, you just can't afford it and should buy it. Um, but now I've you know seen a lot of people doing well where they are leveraging their money. Um, some of them I think some of these people I think are way out of control with it. Um, but it is something that I'm opening up my eyes to. Um, I haven't gotten much into it yet because I mean I have a basically at this point and I'm, it's not a bragging thing because I could be homeless tomorrow, but as of right now, I have an unlimited amount of money that comes in to where I can just buy as many good deals as I find. Um, but, you know, leveraging my money is something that I'm definitely looking to do in the future. I just don't want to do it nowhere near on a scale as a lot of these people do. Right. So you talk about the unlimited amount of deals that you can take down. How are you finding deals right now? Um. I would say the number one way that I get them is word of mouth. You know, I, I brand myself very well. Um, I'm always putting myself out there, whether it's on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, all these networking events, public speaking. I let people know what I do. And in return, a lot of people come to me. Um, hey, I got a deal. Do you want to partner on it? Or, hey, I've got a deal. And I don't even want to mess with it because it's my cousin's house. And, you know, I really want them to be taken care of. Can you just please, you know, try to make something happen where they don't get foreclosed on? So I, I get a lot of deals word of mouth, um, more than a lot of people that tell me they spend 20000 a month on mailers and paper clips and things like that. Right. Um, I've, I've never really done I've – de I've never done a mailer in my life. Um I've never really done bandit signs. I've tried it probably like three different times. Really didn't think that the the money was there for me. Um, I know people who kill it on it. Uh, I just think that my time and my money is spent better in, in other fields. But, you know, everybody has their own strategy. That, I have to say that's it's very impressive in the fact that you've been able to um, create all of this around networking and word of mouth. Um, I, I've never had a guest say that before. It's always been some form of marketing one way or another. Um, the types of properties that you're taking down, are they all mainly buy and holds or are you flipping at all? 
Um, I do flips occasionally. As of right now, I really kind of step back from that just because um, I've been finding deals that are so great that I can make a $20,000, $50,000 wholesale fee and send it off to a flipper and he still make his, you know, good return as well. Um, I'm, I, know, I understand that I could flip it myself and make a hundred, but you know, when I've got a constant and consistent amount of wholesale deals coming in, uh, it's to me, it's a lot less work to just do the wholesaling part. And then I get to pick and choose which ones I want to keep, uh, to be my rentals. And when, when you're wholesaling a property, are you still closing on it yourself or are you now assigning and double closing? Um, it just depends. Uh, you know, if, you know, I know a lot of people who only make $5,000 per wholesale deal, even though they can make more or because, you know, they want to give people the best, you know, that they can just because they want to burn and turn to the next one. Um, I really kind of maximize each deal and, uh, try to get the most out of it for everybody, for the buyer, the seller, and myself. Um, so I take some time on that, but, um, I would just really say that in the whole deal in, I would, I would just say that in the whole field, you know, whenever I choose whichever deals I want to keep or whoever I do this for, um, I, there's just a lot, big thought process that I put into it to decide, you know, what I want to do with it and and how that goes right so i know before we started the interview you were talking a little bit about owner financing and subject twos um let's go into that a little bit and let's talk about subject twos and kind of how you've used that strategy to acquire properties yeah um so i know a lot of people have kind of made that their holy grail and really dove into it and that's like their only go-to strategy um I don't try to use it all the time because I think it's a very sensitive matter anytime you do a subject to, and it puts a lot of people at risk. Um, Even though, you know, we're always in the best interest of everybody, and, you know, of course we have money, and of course we can make the payment, there's always that what if factor. What if the note gets called due on sale? What if, you know, we go broke and can't make the payment? What if the market crashes? And um, I live strictly on morals and I want to always make sure that I'm doing the best I can for everybody in the deal. And we have a company policy that if everybody doesn't walk away happy, then we didn't do it right. Um, so, uh, I definitely sub two. I try to minimize how often that's the strategy we use. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'll get people that are in pre foreclosures, um, you know, from the list that everybody gets. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll, you know, reach out to those people, which I don't really go do a crazy amount to market that like people do. Um, but I'll just call these people and, you know, say, Hey, you know, do you want to do this deal? Let me take over your mortgage. Um, but I mean, that's not really something big I do. Cause like I said, I, I don't really advertise. Um, so yeah, I will put in the work, which I think is a huge difference in, you know, where my success from comes from is I'll never be so successful that I want to stop putting in the work. Um, But, you know, whenever it comes to sub twos, a lot of it's just people coming to me. Hey, my uncle's being foreclosed on. Um, You know, my cousin or uh, I just had a deal that I just bought, I guess, a week ago from today. And it was a five bedroom house in Oak Cliff. And the guy wasn't in foreclosure. He didn't have any arrears at all. Um, but he just kind of knew that his, uh, I guess his whole life was on a downhill slide. And so he was trying to get rid of a rental property that he had and it was in Oak Cliff. He wanted 60,000 for it. And I was like, man, I I really don't want to buy it for that, which it still would have been an okay price, but I would just stop for my money. I could do something better somewhere else. But I told him, you know, what do you have left on the mortgage? And the mortgage was 40000 His uh, payments were 400 a month. And I knew, you know, he has a current tenant in there for 700 a month, so it's cash flowing. 
and I knew that I could get 1200 a month easily. Um, so I've got a lot of connections with Section 8 and all the housing agencies, and I could get somebody in there, you know, with a snap of my finger to where right now it's cash flowing 300 a month, but, you know, without any real work, I could have it cash flowing 800 a month. So I told the guy that I wouldn't buy it from him for 60000 but what I would do is if he wanted to, I would take over his mortgage, and I said, how much money do you really just need to walk away from this house? And, you know, at first he said, well, the 20000 I was like, well, how much do you really need? And he took out a pen and paper and added it all up, and he came up with like $4,300. So I told him that I'd give him the $4,300 to walk away from the property and, you know, feed the property over to me subject to. So we did that. I came out of pocket the $4,300, and, um, you know, I'll get my money back in the first six months of renting this property out. Right. So when you do a subject to, most people, or I say most people, I'll use myself as the example. If I do a subject to, I'm going to keep the mortgage in the original seller's name for six to 12 months, and then I'm going to refinance it out. How do you handle that since you're using your own cash and you're not, you, you don't leverage the money that often? How often do you keep the mortgage in their name? Um, you know, I make it very clear to them. I know a lot of people aren't upfront about a lot of their stuff. I'm so upfront that they're like, okay, shut up. I get it. Um, but I make it very clear to them that, you know, if it's a FHA, which it's usually not, it's usually conventional, but um, I, I make it clear to them, hey, this note's going to stay in your name and that might affect you later. So you're probably going to be stuck with renting from people and not buying a house for as long as this is in my name, which could be the rest of the mortgage. And I have a uh, paper that they signed just saying that I disclosed that. Um, so they're okay with that. So, I mean, typically I try to keep it in uh, the sub two position for, uh, you know, until the note's paid off. If they ever do a due on sale, the money's there for me to buy it. If that ever happened, I would just buy it. And if I want to, then I would, you know, refi it out and, uh, you know, get my money back out of it. Gotcha. So I have, I have yet to have a guest on here that's fully kind of, I guess, taught the listeners about the owner financing strategy. And I know you're big on education. So why don't you take us a minute to walk us through what an owner finance property for you and two dash properties looks like. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's, there's two different ways. There's selling the owner finance, which people tell you about all day long, but then there's buying owner finance, um, which is something that I'm more prone to. Um, I like it cause it puts everybody in a good position. So I feel um, better about it morally. Uh, I'm actually standing in front of a property I just bought last week. It's a uh, fourplex that I bought seller finance. And uh, this was a, the owner was a guy, he was like 77, 78, and I would see him out here. It's right across the street from an apartment complex that I own. And uh, whenever I come out to check on my apartment complex, because we've got some construction going on, I'd watch this old man get out there unloading his lawnmower. And I, you know, approached him first time and I was like, hey, you know, do you know the owner? He's like, yeah, I'm the owner. And I said, would you like to sell this property? And he's like, no, nah, not really. And, you know, I'm stubborn. So, of course, the second time I see him, I ask him the same question again, and he hesitated. So I, I knew that there was a chance, that it's something that he's kind of thinking about. But he told me no again. Um, I didn't see him for a couple of months, saw him again, asked him about it. And he's like, yeah, I think I've got to take 200000 for it. And it's, you know, four units, two bedrooms each. I would say the comps would probably bring it to about 360 ARV in the condition it's in. It's probably worth around 260. He asked for 200, so you know that's a good deal. You know, uh, getting at about 80 percent. But I really just don't want to put my money there because I just know, uh, you know, I can put my money in other ways, or I could just go get a loan and put 20 percent down and and do something like that. And at that price, he wanted cash only. So I told him, I was like, look, man, I've got some other options for you I'd like to discuss. And he was in a rush and just kind of left. Well, the next time he pulled up, I seen him kind of looking around. And I was like, I'm pretty sure this guy's looking for me. So 
but I was going to be smarter this time. Next time, this time I'm going to ask him if he wants to sell the house after he mows this whole fourplex, not before. <laughs> and I let him mow that whole thing, and he was exhausted. He was wore out, and I'm pretty sure that he just hated being there at that moment. And so I walked up to him while he's trying to load up this mower in the back of his truck, and I was like, you ready to sell this thing yet? And he's like, yeah. He didn't, couldn't even say it. He just nodded. And I was like, you know, how old are you? And he told me he was 77. And I was like, you really want to be out here mowing, you know, once a week? And he's like, no. And, but he told me that he wants to have something he can pass on to his son. And I was like, well, I got a perfect situation for you. Because if you sell this to me, sell or finance, you know, you'll have a note. And a note's going to be easier to pass on to your son than a property. Because you pass on the property, you know, you're, you've got all this stuff you got to worry about. Does my son know how to handle this property? Does he know, you know, each tenant? Does he know how to collect the rents? Does he know how to do the taxes on it? You know, all this different stuff. And I was like, you got the note. We'll put it with a note servicing company, and I'd be more than happy to pay for that. And I was like, it would be, you'd be just like the bank. And uh, I talked to this guy, you know, I, I told him I could go, you know, get a line of credit right now at 5% interest. And so I told him, you know, what I'd really love to do instead of giving the money to the bank, I'd like to work a deal with you. And I said, I'll, I'll make you an offer. What do you want cash to be sold right now? And his price went down to 180000 I said, I'll do better than that. I'll give you 200000 but I want to give it to you over 30 years at this 5% interest. And he goes, man, I'm not going to be alive for 30 years. And I was like, well, what kind of terms do you want to do? You know, I want to do something where everybody's happy. And she told me I'd really love to do 20 years. You know, 20 years, if I croak, you know, my son can handle it. And, you know, hopefully he can get the money within a reasonable amount of time. I said, I'll do 20 years, but if I do that, I want a little bit of a rate. And so we signed a contract uh, on 200000 over 20 years at 4.5% interest, and I was going to give them 10% down. So I used a TREC contract, which is, you know, in the state of Texas. I don't know if you have nationwide listeners, but TREC contract, which is the one provided by the state, and I used a seller finance addendum and just put all the terms down, and we put that it would be with a NERT servicing company, uh, which is better – for my office anyways people say save the 30 bucks but man it's only 30 dollars we keep track of everything that way he can't ever come back and try to argue that i missed a payment or whatever there is and um that way it's easier for him to pass it on to his son if he ever passes away and he has a trust and you know it was really easy for him to put the note in his trust uh but in the end i only paid uh 19500 down on the fourplex. I'm going to be paying him 1100 a month. And I'm currently cash flowing 900 a month. But whenever I bring it up, uh, bring up the rent, because he hasn't raised the rent since the day he bought the thing. But whenever I raise the rent, I'm going to be cash flowing 3800 a month. Wow. That's that's a great story right there. And, and I did not expect you to take the owner financing to the the – way where you're purchasing properties but that's a yeah. that's a great testimonial to to using creativity in how you purchase your properties and and to be honest with you that's almost uh even more impressive than like what you were talking about how other people leverage and you know they're taking out loans and things like that um you created a a great deal for both you and the seller by using owner financing there yeah, I think it was better for me, the seller, and for his son. So, and right. ev- everybody walked away happy. Um, so I, I think it'll be good for everybody. And you know, and he didn't have great tenants there. They're still there. Uh, I'm cash flowing on it, but they're not great tenants. These are people that you know really used this old man that didn't know to raise rents, and so he that guy's not making any profit at all. Right. You know, renting out and. They treat them terrible, and, you know, one at a time, I'll, I'll be releasing them from their leases because they're on month-to-month, cleaning up the property, um, and, you know, putting tenants in there at double. Uh, and, when, and when I raise the rent to double, I'm actually still going to be below what the comparable rents are in the neighborhood. That's how cheap wow. that he had them. So I know recently 
you hosted an education, I guess, weekend event here in, locally to DFW. Talk to me a little bit about what that was and, and kind of why that was important for you to do. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people can understand where I'm coming from on this, but I guess I've put myself into a position by branding myself so much that a lot of people look up to me and I probably get with zero exaggeration, 20 to 40 messages a day asking me, would I buy this deal? How do I do this deal? You know, who's the best person for this? And I mean, I get it nonstop. And, you know, between that and all of the work that I do, which is a lot, you know, I probably put in 14 to 16 hour days every day, which it's not hard work. You know, I'm I'm totally living it up for the people that know me. Like, it, it's just I'm putting in the work, and, you know, sometimes you get a little bit brain fried. So uh, people that follow me know that I went on, like, this three-month vacation uh, where I kind of traveled the whole country. And while I was on the vacation, I still got people just blowing me up, blowing me up, messaging me. And I, I don't mind it at all, not one bit. Um, but there is one person in particular, it was, like, 400 messages. And I was like, can you please, 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 please. Just wait till I finish this vacation trip. You know, I'll sit with you and I'll answer every question that you got. She's like, why don't you just do a class? Like, it I just seems smarter to me if you just do a class and answer everybody's questions and kind of explain it all at once. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'll do a class. But, you know, I really didn't plan on it. And uh, sure enough, the very next day while I'm still on vacation, she was like, so when are you doing your class? It's like, oh, my God, I don't know. So she she did that two more times, and then I got home, and she asked me again. I was like, all right, I will figure it out today, I promise. I swear I'll figure it out today. So I started calling around, and I didn't want to do this, you know, $30,000 weekend, come to my seminar. You know, I didn't want to do nothing like that. I really just wanted to educate people, um, but I also wanted to explain to them that it doesn't matter what I can teach you. Um, you got to do it yourself because there's everybody in the world is going to teach you. You can do it. Anybody can do it. You can do it. And I told them the opposite. I said, not everybody's going to do this. I don't believe in every one of y'all. Y'all could do this, but people have to actually go do it. Like you can learn all day long, but until you walk out the door and knock, it's not going to happen. And uh, from what I heard, that alone woke up a lot of people and got some people into action, um, which is great because they've been making all a lot of money and some stuff they're partnering with me on, which is, you know, helps me profit, make some money. Um, but in the class, you know, I taught them everything. I taught them everything I knew about, you know, wholesaling and sub two and, uh, you know, seller finance, whether it's to buy it or whether it's to sell it that way. Um, I had guest speakers out there and, you know, I brought the people that I thought were the best at that subject because I really wanted them to get something informative. And, you know, I only charge people $60 a seat, and I, I just charge that to cut, really cover the expenses of the venue and the food and uh, things like that. And, uh, you know, I just really wanted people to have the best opportunity, and uh, I taught the most that I could in eight hours. I was so terrified, what am I going to come up with that's going to fill up eight hours of speaking time, but it turned out that we ran out of time, so... I guess I could talk about real estate today. I, I can't imagine what that's like. I, I get nervous wondering how I'm going to fill up 30 minutes in these interviews, so I can only imagine what it's like for eight hours for an event like that. Yeah, and you know, the whole time I was talking, people gave me the most blank stare, and I was like terrified. I'm not shy at all, <laughs> so I wasn't terrified talking to people, but I was terrified that I wasn't giving them good content. Like maybe they were like, yeah, yeah, we already know this, or, you know. Right. Or I don't care or whatever. I, I was like, these people just aren't getting what they wanted. But whenever the class was over, like people got up and did like the standing applause and people were shaking my hands, telling me they've been to classes where they spent 15, 20 and $30,000 and they learned more at the $60 event. And I was mind blown. I was, I was mind blown that people have spent $30,000 for an event, which is in no way a, a bad deal if they're teaching you the right things because you can make it easily you know, and return on your first deal, but right. I didn't believe that people are paying for this education and don't even know like the basic, you know, 
one plus one is two kind of stuff. Right. So that was really surprising, and I guess people turned out happy. And they've been asking for a second class, which I really don't know that I want to do unless I get pushed into it. It's, uh, it's, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. It's a lot of work to put that kind of stuff together. It is. It is. It's a lot. So, so my next question is, is what is the driving force behind everything that you do from creating the plumbing business to now your real estate investing and now you're even giving back on the education side of things? What is your why? Uh, really, my reason why is I had to. Um, I remember that I was so poor. I remember going and mowing neighbors' lawns, you know, and I worked a full-time job, but, you know, I had so many bills upon bills and fell for the American dream with the new car and the big house and, you know, just really had overextended myself on just basic necessities. I didn't even have anything real fancy, but I remember going out and trying to mow the neighbor's yard for, you know, five, ten bucks just so I can have food for that night. And it just got to the point where I wanted something better. And, you know, I was working, I worked 80, 90 hours a week for years, for years. And, uh, you know, did it for a company that I asked them for a raise and, you know, they said no. So I quit, and sure enough, two weeks later, you know, my boss came to my house and offered me a $7 an hour raise, and I only asked for a $1 an hour raise. And I was like, man, if they need me this bad, I just really need to be doing this on my own. So um, I went and got my master's license, which people don't realize. It's almost like a doctorate, so it takes you eight years to get a master's in plumbing. And wow. I worked a day job and a night job plus my side jobs to save up $20,000, which took me forever to make $20,000, you know, which I can make now in like two phone calls. And I put in so much work to like better my life and further myself. I mean, I had to, it, it, it was, uh, basically sink or swim. And, uh, I just had to do something better. And thankfully, you know, I was determined enough to make sure that it worked out for me. And I see a lot of people that are in bad positions themselves. And I know that, you know, a lot of people put themselves in that situation, but a lot of people don't. And a lot of people just don't know better. And so I just feel obligated to pass the information on. And if, you know, they don't do anything with it and they don't succeed, it doesn't phase me one bit, but at least I know that I gave them the opportunity and the tools that they needed. Well, that's a, that's an impressive story, man. And, and I did not know it takes eight years to get a master's plumbing license like that. That's, that's amazing that a, that you were able to work that hard and get that and, and build up that first business to the level that you did that now has essentially financed your, your real estate career. So that's, that's an amazing story. Where do you see yourself in five years? Um, to be honest, in five years, I see myself uh, with my rental portfolio being scaled 10 times larger than what it is now. Um, just the things that I've learned in the past two years have really kind of scaled things. Um, on top of that, I'm going to start leveraging some. I'm just not going to do it on a large scale. I'm not going to leverage all my properties, and I'm not going to leverage them to the max. Um, Austin Good, a lot of people know him. He's been uh, introducing me to some people that are uh, helping move my business um, to where I can pick things up a lot faster. Um, and it's I've learned that knowing the right people does a lot, so... Uh, hopefully that'll kind of just expedite everything because, you know, everybody has their goal, whether they want a hundred doors or 500 doors or a thousand, um, which I don't have a number. My number changes every day. You know, I, I remember all I wanted was a rental property and then my goal was to have four. And then I remember my goal was to have 10 and, you know, now it's to have 50 and I'm almost there. And, uh, I'm sure it'll be a hundred and then 500 and, I don't know if I'll ever want to stop. Right. For the people that are listening, what's the best way they can uh, connect with you or contact you? Uh, people can find me on Facebook. I have my personal page that you can follow, or I have 
uh, like a business page where I just kind of going to start putting a lot of content um, where people can learn stuff and then know where to go find more information. But it's Jawad Dashti, J-A-W-A-D, last name D-A-S-H-T-I. Uh, you can also uh, follow our page, 2-Homebuyers. Uh, but I'm always just trying to put content out there. I like to see people grow, and uh, I make sure to surround my, myself with people that have the same mindset. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today to share your incredible story with us. And, uh, you know, I, I see bright things in the future for you. I've been I've been watching you for the past couple of years, and uh, you're, you're definitely a uh, – inspiration to me and my company and, and you know i i enjoy seeing everything that you share on social media um it's more than just sharing solid content and things along those lines but it's you know you're you're educational while also having a good time and and bringing a sense of humor um to an otherwise kind of bland industry so i appreciate that yeah i really try to throw in some humor and just remind myself and also my friends that, you know, as many suits as we might wear and as much money as we might throw around, we're still the same, you know, idiots that we were whenever we were, you know, back in high school or whatever days. And uh, I, it's really just to convince myself that I'm not changing. Um, I, I do always want to change in some ways and I always want to be a better person and a better friend to people, but I don't want to change who I am and be that guy who, you know, it's happened to several investors that I'm sure we both know, but where every picture is just about a Lamborghini and how get on my level or you're not my friend anymore. And I don't, right. I don't want to have that mentality. So, you know, I'm going to share pictures where I eat at Taco Bell. I'm going to share pictures where I'm at Poncho's. Yeah, we go to nice restaurants too, but in the end, you know, we're still the same people and money doesn't change anything i could be broken homeless tomorrow so uh, exactly I, I just try to show everybody hey we can do things right we can work hard and we can have a good time at the same time exactly well thank you jawad for sitting down with us today and sharing that and uh i appreciate everything that you do for the real estate investing community all right thank you for having me all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Thanks so much for listening to the Titanium Vault with your host, RJ Bates III. For more info and to stay up to date, visit www.podcast.thetitaniumvault.com and on facebook.com slash thetitaniumvault. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time on the Titanium Vault. Titanium Vault.